Hello, welcome everybody to today's webinar on building resilience in your DevOps environment. Uh, before we kick off, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. The first one is you can hear us, but we can't hear you. So if you have any questions in the go to webinar dialog box, you'll see a little questions section. Type those there. If they're questions related to the topic matter, we will try to get to those uh, while we cover the material. The other thing is there's a giveaway on this webinar. It's three $50 Amazon gift cards. So make sure you hang out all the way to the end. That's uh, when I'm going to be announcing those and reading off the names of the winners. If you're a winner, you'll get an email with information on how to claim that. And then finally, this webinar is recorded. So after it's all done, you're also going to get an email with a recording. Make sure you share it with your peers, because I know Mitch and I are going to talk about some of the most interesting stuff on Earth. And um, <laughs> share it with your peers, circulate it around, um, because this is going to be really good material and, and, more importantly, very important material. So let's start off with uh, introductions. My name is Chris Riley. I'm a industry analyst at large and editor of sweetcode.io. My background is as a .NET developer. Uh, quickly found out I wasn't a very good developer and I'm better at talking about technology and understanding trends and so forth. I'm joined by Mitch Ashley, Director of Research Analysis and Media Ops. Uh, Mitch, why don't you introduce yourself quickly? Sure, happy to. So I'm a uh... Both a business and technical person, uh, leader of growth companies, and I've done spin outs as well as startups and a few turnarounds, mostly in the cloud and SaaS space, um, a lot in cybersecurity. Uh, I started out as a developer and uh, still kind of keep my fingers a little bit technical here and there. Doing development certainly don't do that full time, but I'm mostly a leader of companies as well as uh, industry analyst, uh, that kind of thing. So I've been blogging, podcasting for Long, long time. So enjoy this very much. Thanks for having this uh, this webinar together with us, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining, Mitch. And security is is what today's webinar is all about. And I want to start uh, with a, a interesting story that just happened a few days ago. Um, both Mitch and I are are pretty heavy users of Zoom. Um, and just a few days ago, it was discovered that Zoom had a zero day attack that would allow um, people to get access to webcams uh, without uh, just via the Mac Zoom client. And all you had to do was get them to visit your uh, website with malicious code. And when we start to talk about resilience in your DevOps environment, and then for all modern application developers like Zoom, who, by the way, responded to this vulnerability very, very quickly. I think they, they patched the client within uh, two days of it being reported. Mm -hmm. But this is the new modern world. I mean, these are the types of threats that all development teams at some point in time almost guarantee you're going to face. And Resilience, in my opinion, really means you know how you build out your development environment to be prepared for for these types of incidents, but also prevent them in the in the future. So I thought this was a really interesting story, and I think that a good way to kick this off, Mitch, is as always, let's let's do some definitions. But in the the modern dev world, it gets kind of weird when you start talking about the uh, bingo of um, you know terminology here and some of the terms that have been thrown around you know lately is DevSecOps, SecOps, DevSec you know in my opinion they're all kind of one in the same and a lot of people's opinions are all completely different so you know what are your thoughts in terms of how we define the connection between security both infrastructure and application security and the development the software delivery chain well, uh, first I would say that, and I think we're going to see more words like this and phrases like this come together because oh, no. what Dev, DevOps, DevSecOps, et cetera, what all those terms represent is really multiple functions or groups within an organization coming together to work together. And that's part of this larger you know, new development world that we're 
we now work in is we're trying to collapse the organizational boundaries and get the working teams working together, not just at phases of development or phases of operation or phases of deployment, but really in a continuous end-to-end -end fashion. And so as more people get involved, people to do a compliance, security, et cetera, the development of course, and operations. That's why I think these terms have evolved. So I think you want to kind of get into each one, but I think that's why we keep coming up with something. A new one seems like every couple of months or so. Yeah, and it's it's not only the joining of teams, it's it's also what I've seen is within individual functions. So when we first started using the term full stack developer. Essentially, what we meant was, you know, a developer who could do front end, you know, back end, and maybe something on the infrastructure. But full stack now really encompasses also their relationship to everything related to production too. So it could be incident management, it hmm. could be um, security, and you know, the unicorns out there, companies like Slack. If you build it, you support it. So you're on call for for code that, that you deploy. And this other term, ship left, which has become very popular, um, is, is implying that even within the dev bringing in that, the understanding of the risks and how to respond. And I'm not, I don't, I'm not 100% sold on the reality of developers being able to take over you know, security responsibilities. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it, it, it's a good question, and you know, I hear and read lots of different thoughts on this. And some folks say, you know, that's sort of the the nirvana we want to head to, which is where the development team is handling that. I, I think in a smaller team, that's realistic. In a larger organization, you have you have functions, corporate security, uh, IT security, cybersecurity, et cetera. So, I, I think the thing that really is important is performing the functions, but also then collaborating with how they get set up. So in a small team, you can address security yourself. In a larger organization, you're gonna to need to include security people. And we're much better off if we do that up front. And I think that there's two perspectives on that. One is there's the dev team of working with the security folks, but there's also, I think security people need to learn dev now. They need to know a little bit more about devs, DevOps and DevSecOps. They just can't say, here's our requirements and you folks need to meet it uh, because this all flows down into the operational part of it and how uh, alerting and notifications and issues are occurring. You, you really have to know some of the software architectures around containers and microservices and all the things that change the attack service. So in a way, we're kind of blending disciplines here. And I think the most important thing that I take away from this evolution is it's about collaboration and it's about people. Yeah. Well, I, it's interesting you brought that up. Um, you know, we, we just mentioned the Zoom zero day, but there's a zero day inside of Docker containers as well. Mm -hmm. Recently found, I think about, you know, two or three months ago, and that points to the, you know, if the security team is not familiar with how container technology works, that that can easily um, be overlooked. You remind me of, and there was another uh, uh, DevOps.com webinar on this where, we talked about, I, I, I talked with an uh, engineer, I'll say he's at a very large clothing manufacturer retail company, has a dev team of 1,000 people. They have a dedicated security team. And you know at that scale, kind of have to, even though they are broken out into individual dev teams and they've embraced microservices and all that good stuff. They have a separate uh, security team. Now, to your point, the security team there invests a lot of effort in stewardship. So stewardship of security. And yeah, sometimes they are the regulators, right? They put their foot down and they say, you can do this, you can't do that. And they, they vet tooling and, and so forth. But at the same time, they hold an annual uh, twice a year security hackathon. Mm -hmm. So they get all the developers together into a room. They say, go and break stuff. Um, you know, and, and not only is it an exercise where usually there's two or three outcomes where they actually find um, potential exploits or holes in their application, but also it's a relationship building. Thing. 
So now they have credibility. And I think you've talked about this too when it comes to leadership. Now they have credibility when it comes time to have that hard conversation of you guys messed up. How are we going to fix it? Or you can't, you want to do this, but sorry, right now you can't. Um, I, I, th I think that's really interesting. And I think it points to what you're saying about, you know, getting banding together. Well, it, it's, we're, we live in a very dynamic world and it's becoming even more so every day. You know, I talk about serverless computing and the workflow for CI, CD type environments. And uh, I think that also meshes well with an organization that kind of has continuous improvement built into its psyche so that that way you're constantly looking at how you're doing things and how you can make it better, but also how you can triage and diagnose and lessons learned and all those kind of nice things. There's quality uh, methodologies and terms for those kind of things. But the more you can understand what's happening, why it happened, what you do to improve it and fix it, it raises the institutional knowledge, the knowledge of all parts of the organization. And that I think that is a big, big advantage of dev, DevOps, DevSecOps, et cetera, is getting those organizational boundaries broken down, stop finger pointing or handoffs in, in very manual serial fashions uh, so that you can have continuous learning all through that whole cycle. Because the things we see nine months later, take the Zoom example, right? It was an interesting, interesting study. It happened relatively quickly, but it was about 24 hours before Zoom actually decided to right. to make a change. Their initial reaction was, well, we've had this reported. We don't think it's as serious as what people are saying. As they listened more to their customers, security researchers, et cetera, and you know, now, now we look at it and say, hey, if someone sent me this URL, clicked on it, boom, boom their webcam can now be activated in, in some meeting and they don't know it. Okay, yeah, that's pretty obvious. You got to fix that. But at first, you don't quite understand what the implications or how it might be used in the wild, et cetera. So they took about 24 hours before they said, okay, yes, we, it came out. I think the CEO even came out and said, yes, we get it. This is something we need to fix. Here's a temporary fix or, or something to get us started, and then we'll roll out something lar larger. You know, kudos to them for addressing it. Um, but you've got to have that incident response. And this all involves the CEO of the company. So it isn't, you know, a QA person f talking to a dev person to fix it. It's something that invokes an entire process. Um, I advise a group of CIOs, and one of the common questions, uh, topics that we talk about is, how does the CIO talk with a senior executive team and even with the board about security incidents. So I point that out only just to say all of these things are connected and sometimes it's going to involve some very senior parts of the organization. And I wouldn't want to be the dev person to try to figure out how that has to work. I'd like to work with the compliance and the cybersecurity team and others so that we have a process when it happens or if it didn't go well this time, we, we make it better next time. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I think, you know, the fact that it's it, when things do go wrong, it involves everybody in the organization. It's not just the technical team. I mean, this is it's a PR issue. It's a marketing issue. It's a, you know, you don't want to be sending out marketing emails on the same day that you have an, you know, a security breach going on. So so it's uh, that's a big deal. So let's let's start to talk about, you know, what it means. Um, to to pull this together i think a lot of the attendees are probably going yeah i've heard this before stewardship culture you know mm -hmm. what are the things sometimes it's not in their power to get the executive team to even buy into this um mm -hmm. what are the things that that they can start looking at and i think it it really starts with um, automation and that's where we get into workload uh protection so you know, I, all of this, everything in the software delivery tool chain, and it's, it's kind of the DevOps mantra, you need to automate, 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 and that's true mm -hmm. with security as well. But also what we've seen as DevOps has matured, and people have gotten more real, I keep on saying that this is the year when DevOps gets boring, because we're starting to talk about real stuff, and we're actually starting to talk about stuff 
that we didn't expect to talk about, you know, previously, things like vulnerability scanning and, you know, compliance and, and creating workload um, protection, a lot of, you know, maturity around um, these environments. How, how do you see the ecosystem has, has kind of changed in terms of automation and tooling that's now available to bring that security, um, all of that security into your domain? Well, you, you certainly you hear the word automation a lot more now, um, not just the you know the technology containers, et cetera, or the tools. And I think one of the reasons why you hear so much more about automation is realizing that for software to, to evolve into a production environment, into a maintenance environment, into, but also in this continuous delivery world, um, you can't rely on manual processes. For one, it can't scale. Two, it's too complex. Three, it's too dynamic. Uh, so now there's much more emphasis on how you shift the shift left, of course. Uh, security early in the cycle. Well, that doesn't mean hire more people to come run scans for you. It's built it into your CI CD process, right? And it's all, if you're gonna add more tools, and I'll share a little story about this, but if you're gonna add more tools, you don't wanna to have to add more people, more training, et cetera. And now you do need to know the tools and understand them. But I was um, recently interviewing for another podcast, um, a, C a CISO from a major, let's say online tool company, communication companies, and starts with a T. I won't tell you who it is, but anyway, um, one of the things that he was raising is it was extremely sensitive of when he would consider introducing a new tool because the capacity of the security team to take on yet another tool, yet another tool that's producing information, yet another tool that's not gonna require action. Those are all manual processes that are distracting extremely valuable resources. And so it was, it was a big deal to add a new tool to that environment um, and only things that included things like automation can fit into the entire workflow workload process uh, because it impacts developers just like it might impact a, a security engineer. So that's why I think one, one of the reasons is we push more and more into the dev cycle. It's gotta be automated. Um, and it also has to have elements like everything has to log, everything has to log everything. We wanna know about um, authentication, identity, we want to know uh, any kind of errors that are happening because now we can apply automated log tools, log analysis, security analysis tools to those. There's so much happening, it has to be automated. So I think as, if I started on the front end of this as a development manager, leader of a dev team, uh, or maybe just the kind of lead developer, is think about automation from the beginning. Doesn't mean you have to automate everything right up front but design your process so that at some point we know we're gonna automate this. At some point, we're not gonna do this manually. When we get to that point, what's our strategy? So we're ready when we get there. Right, yeah, and you're thinking about the pipeline as its, as its own activity and its own application. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I mean, it, 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 that is one fallacy that a lot of organizations kind of turn to is expect the tools to do the job, you know, do everything for them. And, and, and the team needs to really guide that adoption. And, and like you said, think about automation uh, forefront. I'm going to do a quick logistics pause. If any of you have questions related to the content, um, please type them in the question dialogue in GoToWebinar and we can you know, certainly surface those as they make sense. Also, don't forget that there is an Amazon giveaway at the end of this webinar. Um, three $50 Amazon gift cards, so stick around uh, in case your name is called for that in the giveaway. Um, so one of the things, as again, as we talk about as delivery chains mature and we start taking more seriously um, workload protection and um, other aspects of our DevOps environment. Uh, one of, somebody said something to me that was, you know, that I kind of had an aha moment, which was um, they talked about the materials, I'll say, associated with their DevOps practice. So things like um, run books and scripts and maybe documentation, maybe secrets. 
These are things that are not part of the application necessarily, mm -hmm. but are things that need to be secured as well. So, you know, you ask the question, okay, where do you, where do you store this stuff? And, and the response I got in this case was, oh, we store them in an S3 Amazon bucket. Um, and I started thinking, well, you know, who's securing that, <laughs> right? Because we know, we've heard about other breaches where the breach was initiated by getting access to secrets and things that are not application or vulnerability application stuff. Um, so now we're starting to talk about securing things other than just the application itself, right? You were talking about source repositories um, and all of the other stuff that comes around with just managing your delivery chain. You know, what do, what do DevOps teams need to consider to, to protect that stuff? Well, I, I would start with first identity and access management. That's sort of the, the linchpin of it. And of course, moving away from shared credentials, uh, things using digital certificates to get access, uh, setting up controls on a group basis rather than on an individual basis. So that access control, those are where the fundamental starts. And why, why I raise that first, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, but you know, I, uh, in a business context, I always say salespeople are like water. They'll flow to what are the easiest path to the result of making a sale. Same thing for someone who's trying to, to break into a, an environment, a hacker or whatever. Is they're going to find the easiest right. thing? That's why we hear so much about social engineering, et cetera. Well, what's the easiest thing to get is someone's password. That's why it's, it's such a big deal if someone uh, puts in a secret that gets logged into GitHub. And those are all the kind of things that you should scan for. And of course, you can put that into a secrets management tool, key management tool, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't suggest just an S3 volume would quite qualify, but <laughs> you might want to look at something more serious. But I would also, sorry, those are our webinar um, mascots here. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, I would, uh, it's the group. <laughs> I would also suggest that um, you start looking at how you standardize um, what security elements that you're going to put in place. So if you're going to look at container security, build images that have container security built into it already. So a developer, someone, configuration specialist isn't required to go make that happen. Look at standardized uh, virtual images across the board. So you know, someone spinning up a new operating system, a new environment, new dev environment, new test environment production, all of that is if it can be done automated, no one has to do anything, it's already been secured, it's scanned regularly, it's updated by, by the process, by the folks who do that, um, all the better. Because then, you know, it's sort of like the band showing up at, at, at the performance, right? The gear's all there, they plug in and they play. That's what you want your developers or whatever the person is that's part of that. So. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so going back to kind of the basics, which is, you know, uh, the awareness, the stewardship and, you know, don't don't store database credentials in a text file in an S3 bucket. Don't do that. Now, if you are legitimately using a source repository, um, an S3 bucket, make sure you have scanning capabilities like standard you know, vulnerability scanning and um, tooling to to keep tabs on that as if you would treat any other kind of system of record um, type files. But then you move into, um, you know, what was I gonna say around that? You, you move into full automation and, uh, you know, you, you have the stewardship, you have all that good stuff, but one of the things that's that even gets more challenging is that in the world of microservices and stateless containers or stateless um, images, you know, you can the the chances of something going from a development box into production are much higher. There's a lot of variables. There's a lot of moving parts. And so, what you were talking about there is having policies and de facto container images um, that are vetted, approved. Um, ready to go, ready to ship, all they're missing is the code, that's a, that's a very serious thing because developers can go on their dev machine and can move very quickly and introduce vulnerabilities from open source projects or whatever it is into a container image. If that container image ends up into production without hitting a firewall 
of sorts that's going to be able to scan that and know know that it's a no go because it doesn't pass the policies. That's that's a risky thing, and and that's where the automation uh, absolutely comes into play. Well, and there are there are workload protection products. This is this webinar is sponsored by Semantic. They of course have their cloud workload protection uh, product, which is a very comprehensive, pre-integrated, uh, great kind of solution. For that, you can go it alone and build it yourself. Of course, then you're, you're even more in the tools managing business. Uh, but either way, I think you know that's that's what I was meaning by think about how you're going to do this, not when you're starting out as a three developer team, but you're going to grow to 20 yeah. or 50 or you're going to get acquired by some other company or maybe you're going to acquire companies as a startup. Um, larger, larger organizations, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer of understand how the organization works and determine how you can fit in the new approach, the new technology into what the organization already understands. It's not always possible. But if you have a pre-production process before, you know, in a, in a traditional world, maybe monolithic application, those things are introduced through a staging process that someone else vets, et cetera, before it goes into production. Great, if that's what they know how to do, then set up your workload um, work path so it mimics that kind of a process. And maybe it'll be automated at some point, maybe it's gonna be automated now or down the road, but the less, um, sort of change management you have uh, to make feel like people feel like it's so different they don't understand it, the better chances you're going to have it being adopted. Same thing for security, et cetera. So I think that's, I think um, as development teams, we need to think about empathy of who the other parts that are going to be working with us and need to work with us, put ourselves in their shoes and vice versa. I think, I think you'll get the same response from your counterparts. If they know you're interested in helping them with how to implement your security policies or whatever it might be, then they're going to work with you. They're going to help you. It's back to that collaboration theme. Absolutely. Yeah, so we actually um, have a question that I've decided I'm going to take host privilege and morph into um, an evolution of you know what we've been talking about. We talk a lot about shift left, but there's also shift right which is production scanning, production security, um, automation around being on call. Not, the question specifically is about on call. Um, I'm not gonna list the vendors here because every single one of them has done at some point a webinar with devops.com and they're, they're all very good. What matters is how, it, how, it, how it's being used. But let's talk a little bit about you know, what happens when, when the Zoom situation comes to fruition and you are on call and you do you do need to deal with um, the incident you know how do you manage that and I think that on the tooling side you know you have your incident management tools which are very important you have communication of some sort which some people will combine as part of incident management some people will keep separate I mean, there's a ton of tools out there for um, col uh, collaborating one of the things that I know is really important is the amount of metadata and you talked about this earlier it's kind of like log 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 create visibility log i mean that's the bottom line is if you build automation log it um, that's where the on-call management is really important because you need that metadata to help support response and you also need a plan because the response is going to cross if, if it's a catastrophic failure or a, a vulnerability exploit, that response is going to cross legal, it's going to cross marketing, it's going to cross everybody. So you also need a plan. And that's part of you know good on-call management is having a plan of how to deal with different types of responses. Um, and especially like with Zoom, you know, how are you going to respond to the world even? So shift right is, is also uh, a big thing, bringing this in, all of this technology and stewardship into production as well. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Daniel who asked that question, Chris, because uh, one of the things I think is probably most important, he's asking about what are best practices for selection, I think, of a, a tool like this for on-call management. One is how does, how does your organization communicate? Are you an email company? 
are you a SMS texting company? Are you a Slack company? What is it? What is that most common, uh, well-adopted form of communication? If you're not a Slack company yet, but you're going to buy a tool that you want to integrate to Slack and start everybody having using it, that might be pretty tough adoption curve right up front. Yeah. So I, I would say, and kind of back to what I was saying before, if the company is used to sending out texts as a way to, to communicate when there's an escalation that happens. So I would look at that first. How do you either want to establish if you don't have one yet or, or what's the way you already communicate and make sure you select the tool that is super effective in that way. To me, of course, there's, there's metadata, there's also tracking of what's happening, a common place to go get all that information. I think those are pretty fundamental basic to tools now. The, the other part, and there can be systems, there can be just email and other forms of, of process for how things get escalated. So at some point, you know, it's gonna get escalated outside of the DevOps or DevSecOps team, and you've got to integrate, you've got to talk with marketing, communications, legal executives, et cetera. People need to know what, what are they supposed to do? Where is this at? Um, they need context of what's happening. Because if you're the person sort of holding the bag and like, I know it's been escalated, but I'm waiting to hear, or I don't know what the process is, where can I find out where it's going? I think having that flow, and of course we're kind of emphasizing the the Zoom-ish type of uh, security vulnerability situation, but those those are sort of the exceptions versus the bread and butter things that happen every day. Um, but those are some just suggestions, Daniel, that I would have in thinking about on-call management tools. And I'm sure there's a lot of uh, trusted advisors you could ask for recommendations for tools. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, um, you know, now <laughs> security has always kind of been a cuss word for for development teams. Um, but I think maybe an even worse cuss word is compliance. So besides kind of real building security into this, we have new things like GDPR. If you're already in the compliance world, you're you're pretty familiar with this. You know, is it the same process that organizations consider when they start to think about bringing compliance also into um, their their development ecosystem I mean certainly dev environments are very are becoming more and more used to I'll say um, vulnerability scanning and license um, automation and, and so forth that's been around for a while but now you know you have to think about like with GDPR you have to think about you know did the change in the application we just make introduce new PII that we now have to you know be concerned about how, how do how do you frame is it the same problem or is, is there unique elements to the compliance side of things well it, it is its own discipline and of course your 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 compliance is dealing with multiple entities that are defining the compliance standards I think first of all is working with a trusted knowledgeable source about what the compliance requirements are and not to detail for you the 100 pages of whatever description. It's kind of boiling it down for the dev team, the security team, for what do we have to do to implement in terms of process? What is it we're trying to protect? If it's customer information, uh, like for example, with uh, GDPR, the customer has to have the right to uh, you know, have all their data erased from a company. And what are those requirements? And then built that into your, into your dev cycle of what you're building into your product, of course, you're probably gonna have to do that for everything, right? To meet compliance for that. So there's there's that part of it. There is a reporting aspect. Are we following the compliance? Okay, so how does that information get produced to the people who need to take that data and that turn it into some kind of information that is provided to third-party auditors, maybe uh, regulatory agencies, whoever there might be. So there's a life cycle to compliance. And a dev team, uh, an ops team, a, a security team, or the combination of all those have a role to play, but there's also past that of what other people do with that. So I think the main thing I would think about from a DevSecOps team is procedurally, what do we need to know about to comply with this? What are the essentials of GDPR, for example, or PCI DSS or HIPAA, whatever it might be, um, NIST security standard for security networks. Um, and then 
what are the things we need to incorporate in our process into our products and software that we're building? And then what data do we need to capture and how we make sure we make that accessible and in the easiest way possible for the people that need to use that? And guess what? Then they're not going to come and bug you and ask you for yet again another report, yet again another report. They can have it sitting on a database in Tableau or something yeah. like that to do the reporting that they need, or it's in a format that they can already consume and it makes everybody's life easier. Yeah, and I've seen a ton of approaches to this. I've seen, you know, related to, you know, kind of a silo, data silo centric um, approach where you build in, you know, all the tooling you need to protect that data silo. You have great policies and access rights to the silo and so forth. But also what we've always been talking about this, this whole time is visibility, being able to get access to um that data and understand and i think what you brought up about the fact is like well yeah now it also has to be a part of your product so you have to know how you're going to be able to clear the data you also have to be able to tell people how you do it <laughs> and you know when you start collecting new data you better be prepared to build that you know that tooling in as well it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting challenge and and i i do have a lot of confidence in the fact that especially with license scanning, vulnerability scanning, all of this stuff, a lot of the data can be surfaced in a compliance dashboard of sorts where multiple people in the organization and have access to it and so forth. But there's, there's a lot uh, of potential there uh, for, for automation. And I've also seen a lot and, and stuff where um, you get some intelligence around uh, the the data that's put out there. So, um, so that's really interesting as a part of security, data security. You mentioned well, one um, thing. I want to I mention one more thing, up. Chris, before we go to that. I want to sure. just emphasize the data part of this. And one of the considerations we have to have around data is in the operational environment. Um, classifying or categorizing data. I'm not speaking in a military government sense, but around sensitivity of data. Because, because we have a greater attack surface, with things like container, microservices, APIs, all of these things that have more exposure now, um, we want to be conscious of workloads and what we're maybe putting on one cluster of uh, a virtual environment. Uh, where we may have something that's extremely sensitive with customer data or proprietary internal data commingle with something that's you know maybe a lower importance but still important but less sensitive the same environment with that ent entire tax surface is all in one compute storage et cetera environment you know it's it's the easiest point in and now you can get to the most sensitive stuff so think about when it comes to these compliance uh, requirements um, categorize the data and what data is it that needs to be have greater protections because it all doesn't require the same thanks for letting me jump in with that <laughs> no and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ping pong that back actually because you made me think of something in the world of uh, testing um, service virtualization uh, mocks you know needing needing to test on real data also adds adds to it a little bit because you know you want to actually try to test on real data but that's also part of the compliance challenges because you may not be able to test on real data you, you just can't um so so it becomes um kind of fun i i'm really big into the service virtualization mocks um stuff and the, and the testing that's being being done around there your test so we'll, we'll open it up just to secure lab. right <laughs> As production. Yeah, right. Or and and yeah, I mean it. And actually, that that's a really good point. Is is parity across environments? You know, ideally, your dev environments have the same amount of security as your production environments. Where classically, that's not the case. But your CI/CD environments probably absolutely should. Because organizations don't think about parity very often across their environments. They kind of just go, "Hey, devs have their infrastructure, CI/CD." Um, into end testing has its infrastructure, and then we have production, which is a completely different thing. So, well, um, going to open it up to questions here in the last five minutes, um, and reiterate: if if anybody here has any questions, type it in the question dialog. If we don't get to it in the next five minutes, we will um, come back to you and hopefully respond after. This webinar is recorded. Make sure you share it with your peers, and then. 
um, uh, right after we go through the questions here, um, we will we will do the Amazon gift card giveaway. So I saw somebody raise their hand. If you could type to the question in the question dialog, that would be useful. But one of the things you said earlier, which might be counterintuitive in a way, but made a lot of sense. And I think it plays into adoption of tooling. Um, you said, you know, before you, before you, something around before you just jump in, think about the way your organization currently communicates. And the way and 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 see if you can build on top of that, and then maybe start to bring in other tooling. What have you seen just in terms of how organizations approach adopting, you know, this these technologies? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Uh, one 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 thing that comes to mind is um, I wasn't on the team, but um, one of the last companies I worked with had an extremely effective dev team. And they were very adept at working as a remote team. Matter of fact, nobody worked in an office. Nobody worked side by side. They, have, they had times where they got together where it was, you know, they could get enough people together, but that was a rare event. Um, but that same team had to work with people who were present also in a headquarters location with other developers, other network engineers, security engineers um, around technology that they were developing. And so there was this kind of bridge of who's going to work which way, right? You're going to work our way, we're going to work your way. And so one of the things that they they started doing was they leveraged a common platform, and that was slow with two of them, Slack and Zoom, making talking products here. But of course, you could use lots of different tools. Um, <clears throat> and they, they used that as the common denominator. So, for example, they always had a, a online session going, not just when there's a meeting, that everybody was was online with video on and communicating that way. Hmm. Wow. Whenever they're working, they're online, they've got video, they're connected. And so that way, you know, whether you're in the office and can turn to the next person or walk wow. down the hall, or you know, you're I'm in Colorado and you're in DC or you know, Romania, wherever it might be, you know, you could talk to that person and collaborate. So it, it broke down that barrier and by picking a few common things that everybody's going to do you know they didn't pick 12 tools we're all going to use exactly the same they picked two and it really made a difference now this is an organization you know total size of a couple hundred so it's not a large enterprise but i think the same model applies right so if the way to communicate and escalate things um, is through email and that's how your company works don't try to get folks to jump onto Slack to uh, to force them into your process. It's a little bit of what I was saying before. Maybe it's an evolution to there. Um, maybe it'll never happen. Maybe it's you're always going to be an email dominant culture. So leverage it. You don't have to as an individual team or a smaller part of the group. You know you can be using more contemporary tools. But who knows? They may join you too. Absolutely. That's great. So. This next question um, from Brendan, this was written for you, Mitch. This has got your name all over it. And I love it because it's a conversation that we've been having about constantly, you know, the frustration around the CEO not being maybe even technical enough to ask the right questions, right? So the question is around the, you know, the difference between the relationship and the difference between the CISO and the CIO and the challenges that they face in explaining the need for automation, for practices, for stewardship, whatever it is within the organization to the CEO. Um, and these are all roles you've played. So they are. Fantastic. Yeah, they are. Well, it's actually, I love this question because it's essentially, it's talking about how do we as technical parts of the organization or security, regulatory, et cetera, parts of the organization talk with senior executives? And part of this question is, what's the difference between the, the CISO and the CI, CI role? And then how do they communicate effectively with, the, with people like the CEO? There, there is a couple of things. One is, um, in the technical world, we love to show and communicate in ways that demonstrate our discipline. So for a security person, we need to talk in security language, um, security terms, 
et cetera, that other security people are going to, of course, know and absolutely, you know, grok. Um, but someone in the dev team may have no idea what you're talking about. Same thing for dev folks. Same thing for finance, et cetera. So, so my point being is, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes. So if you're the CISO and you're working with the CIO, first question you ask about the other person or the other organization is, what is it they're at being asked to do? What is it that's important they're trying to accomplish? What is the CIO being asked to do? Are they being asked to reduce cost? Are they being asked to do accelerate digital transformation? Sorry to use another buzzword. Um, are they being asked to um, cut down call times in, in the call center? Are they being asked to help raise um, the MPS score for customers? You know, what is it that the CISO or the CIO is being driven by so that I as the CISO can talk to them knowing that's what's going to drive their decisions and how they're going to come to me? Because if I talk outside of the realm of those things that that person or that group is trying to accomplish or being asked to do, it's going to be a secondary thing and maybe tertiary or you know tenth on the list for us to communicate. So so I'll turn that around. One other way this question asked was most CEOs don't have the technical bench strength to work directly with the CCO, CISO or CIO. How does that how do you how do you handle that? You have to again put yourself in the other person's shoes. Now. I heard a joke one time. It's 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 of course not totally true, but what are the three biggest problem every CEO has? Revenue, revenue, and more revenue, right? <laughs> They're concerned with meeting some some goals that the board, the owners, et cetera, have been have asked them to accomplish, increasing profitability, increasing revenue, whatever it might be. So when you walk in as a CIO or a CISO or an IT person wanting more people, more tools, whatever, it's not about the tools. It's about why, what's the benefit and the value to the organization. If, it's, if we're going to adopt, adopt the next level of DevOps or incorporate DevSecOps um, into one group and we need some tools to do that, what's going to let us do faster? It's going to help us get products out sooner, have better customer experience, better customer. So what are those things that the CEO cares about? And put it in that language. Um, so you can go to her or him and say, I know we're working really hard on making our customers happy and, and improving the experience that they're getting working working with us as a, as a supplier or customer, uh, them as a customer. Here's how I think we can do that, right? We, we take too long to get problems resolved in our systems to customers. So we'd like to do that in hours instead of days or days instead of weeks. If we can do that, I've talked to the finance people, they've modeled it for me. Here's what this could impact, how it could impact the company. So to do that, and I can't promise we're gonna get exactly those numbers, but that's the target we're shooting for somewhere in that range. I'd like to spend this amount of money and then you CEO, she or he can look at it and say, well, if I can get that return on investment by spending X dollars there or a different return on investment from somebody else that's asking for me for money, where do we put our bets? That's how they look at it. So put it in the terms of your audience. If you're the technical side, put it in business terms. Don't make them learn the technology. You're, our role is not to educate the world on our expertise. It's to translate it into effective ways to communicate and make decisions and and produce results that's ultimately what's going to count yeah so one other small twist on that question was the the, the potential budgetary conflicts between the cio and the, and the CISO. um you know my hope would be they can band together and work together but i obviously there are scenarios where maybe the budgets are complete competing depends on the organization is there is it the same story is it do you, do you get together and uh, kind of have a unified message how does that work well i uh, i mean I'd, I'd answer this several ways one is uh, there's a tendency particularly in it to put things in the operational side of the budget and to grow that bottom line so every day every year the the 
to just keeping the lights on, that cost goes up and up and up. And part of it is maybe costs go up, but it's also that we add more to it. <clears throat> and that frustrates other people because now you're hiding money and and uh, you can't make decisions about was that more valuable than something else. Um, so I think the more you can attach where you're spending money and back to the business value or to the audience who's going to make that decision, what, what they value, the more easily you can put compare puts and takes. Um, so one of the things not everyone might realize, but there's a really important thing that happens as you move up in the organization at a certain level, maybe it's VP, SVP, VP, C level titles, is you are now responsible for looking across the organization and making decisions in a whole, not just as your vertical function. So if you are in a CISO role and you're in a CIO role, you should make all your decisions both on what do I need to do? What do I need to spend money? What's important based on what my responsibilities are, what I'm being asked to get done, and what's the best thing for the company? And it may it, it may be the CIO that's looking at it and saying, I desperately need this, but in the context of the company, the CISO needs to spend that money and he or she needs to go to take that budget. That's how this executive should need to look at it. Not everybody does that. But that's really the the CEO needs to hold people accountable for making decisions that way. At least that's how I would do it. Yeah, and this uh, again, that question was kind of designed for you, and I think it's a fantastic conversation because I think a lot of organizations are challenged with knowing what they want to do to be more secure, to be more agile, to automate, time selling it, and like you said. It comes down to what value is going to deliver and the problem that's important to the person who you're trying to sell it to. So, well, Mitch, with this was fantastic. Again, uh, make sure you share this with your peers. Um, this webinar was hosted by DevOps.com and sponsored by Semantic. Um, it's going to be recorded. You can share it. Uh, and now we are going to do the three giveaways for the $50, three $50 Amazon gift cards. Yay! Um, <laughs> money if you are uh, one of the winners you'll get an email um, letting you know and uh, how to claim that so the first winner is Danny C the second winner is John M and finally the third winner is Mike R so congratulations to those three winners spend it wisely um, Mitch, thank you. It's always fun doing uh, webinars with you. I look forward to the next one. And thank you to everybody who joined us today to talk about building resilience and security into your DevOps environment. Have a great day.